Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Open Access Australasia's webinar number one for 2022. I'll just do some introductory comments here, just uh, while we have more people joining uh, the session this afternoon. Um, so we're going to record the webinar and post it on the website with slides so that you'll have that later. Uh, I'll just ask you please to keep your microphone on mute and also turn off your camera. We're going to have a question session at the end. So we invite you to type your questions into the chat. And we promise that we will finish on the hour or just before. Let's get started. My name's Martin Borshert, uh, and I'm the chair of Open Access Australasia at the moment. I'm also the university librarian working with University of New South Wales. I'd also like to introduce you also like then to like the Ginny Barber, um, who is the director Open Access Australasia. Um, this being the first session of the year, uh, we would like uh, to talk um, about what happened in 2021 around open access and, and to give reflections and then also make some comments on what we see coming this year um, also. I just also like to start with an acknowledgement of the Bedigal and the Gadigal peoples um, who are the traditional owners of the land here in Sydney where UNW is located. I'll also like, uh, uh, I'd also like um, as well uh, to, uh, to also work with an acknowledge of the Turbal and the Yagara peoples. Um, who are located um, up there where you are, Ginny, um, because you're located um, in Brisbane and working um, also on QT site today. And I'd also like to pay my respects uh, to elders. Okay, so thank you. I'm going to um, hand over to Ginny, who's going to speak to some slides for us today. Great, thanks, Martin, and hello, everybody. It's great to be back in um, back in webinar land in 2022. Um, so I'm going to do an overview of open access glo globally, regionally, and also just update you on some things that we've been up to. Um, and as then Martin said, we'll we'll have a brief discussion of some of the things that we're thinking about for 2022, and then we'll open it up to questions. So please do type your questions into the chat if you'd like to. So. Um, Open Access Australasia, um, we are a, a diverse um, organisation. We have 20 uh, institutions in Australia and eight in New Zealand that support us. Uh, we also have Alia as one of our supporting members and we have affiliate organisations, um, the ADA, Toa Toa, Creative Commons Australia and Wikimedia Australia. Um, and we're really delighted that in last year, last year we had three of those three, three of those members were new. So that was Alia, the Australian Digital Alliance and Wikimedia Australia. And that really talks to the fact that we are keen to expand um, the remit of open access and talk about it uh, more widely. Um, uh, our executive committee, as Martin said, he's the chair of the executive committee and the members of our executive committee are up there. Uh, they are drawn from across our, our members across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Tom Cochran is our patron. Um, and I, we have a, a small organization, so I'm the director and we have two project officers, Sandra Fry, who, who many of you may know, she organizes our, these webinars and also our newsletter, and Sally Murray Walsh, who came on board last year to uh, develop resources for us. So in 2021, we uh, re reviewed our principles and the executive committee um, uh, decided on the ones that we wanted to um, highlight as, as really key to the work that we're doing. And I'm just gonna talk about two of them really here. So the first one is around equity and scholarly communication and the importance really that as we move to a more open ecosystem that we um, have, we continue to, we, we don't uh, end up with a system where we, um, there's a, a barrier to publishing research and um, um, communicating research in the same way in the past there was a barrier to uh, publishing and accessing, in the past accessing research. So that's a really key principle for us. And the one that's linked to that in particular is the importance um, of a diverse ecosystem of open access approaches. So that ranges from everything from the fully open access journals through to repositories, through to experimentation in new models. And for example, the type of thing that we've seen during the pandemic that's been incredibly important preprints. Um, and you know, in our region, the need for uh, uh, journals that support indigenous research 
um, is clearly very important as, a, as an example of something that's not necessarily covered by the sort of larger type of open access approaches that we see. So those, those are our, uh, the principles that we, we, um, we adhere to. Um, and in 2021, and we, came, we developed our priorities for, the, for 2021 and 2022, and uh, there's, they're just three, so uh, but fairly large ones. So the first one is around advising um, on regional, national and international strategies in open research, and I'll talk about some of those as I go through. Um, we were very keen to establish uh, Open Access Australasia as the authority of regional source for um, for open access, uh, we changed our name in 2021 from the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group to Open Access Australasia. And, but more importantly, we developed our, our, our new website and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, but one of the key things there is, is the sort of real key list of resources of that support open access across, across this region. Um, and then the third one is around supporting a, communities of practice for open access in Australasia. So we run the Australian Open Access um, Community of Practice and we contribute and support the New Zealand um, open access community of practice, which is very well uh, run uh, from New Zealand. So uh, in both of those places, what we've understood is the need for um, communities of practice as being a very important way of um, helping people navigate the open access uh, landscape, which we know is kind of complex and confusing and rapidly changing. So what about um, what happened in open access in 2021? So I think it's fair to say that uh, last year, as in the previous year, the importance of OA was really demonstrated by the pandemic. But, you know, in fact, the importance of open science more widely. Um, we know that um, uh, open access publications uh, for, for the vast majority of stuff that was published during the on the pandemic was still open access. But what we also started to see was some of those publications going back behind paywalls, um, partly mainly because of the fact that the licenses associated with the our research that was published was not made, um, they were not made fully open access, so they were not published, for example, without a, with a Creative Commons license. So we began to see a sort of something, a sort of rowing back somewhat of open access on some of the open publications. Um, we also saw an increased uh, uh, discussion around the importance of open science. Um, and I think, you know, I think it would be pretty clear to say that uh, we know for absolute certain that um, the rapid advances that happened in, van in vaccine development in other areas across the pandemic simply would not have happened without the rapid sharing of resources that happened um, during the pandemic. Um, and the conversations are now sort of moving on in this area. So one of the things that we've seen is the need to think about, well, if it worked for the pandemic, what does it mean for um, other really important areas that you know, we're facing as, as a society at, at the moment? And global and climate change is clearly one of the most important of those. And um, last year, at the end of last year, Creative Commons, Eiffel and Spark um, uh, launched a collaboration to um, uh, ensure that the climate literature is open access. And I think that's where we're gonna see the next um, conversations happening around about the importance of open access and open science. Uh, so what else happened in 2021? I think the UNESCO recommendations on open science was probably uh, one of the most important ones. Um, we were uh, pleased to be able to have been part of this in some way. We, um, we were, there was a large um, global consultation on the whole process, which actually started before the pandemic back in, back in 2018. Um, and in the middle of last year, there was a meeting of experts. Um, uh, Australia participated and I was able to uh, provide some advice to that. And that was the point at which the final wording of the um, recommendation was agreed. Um, it's much, again, much more than open access. It includes um, uh, open science more generally. So that includes scientific publications, but also research data, educational resources, citizen science and open infrastructure are also really highlighted. Um, and that was adopted in November, 2021. And um, Australia was one of the uh, countries that adopted it. So I think one of the things that we're gonna see over the next year or so is the importance uh, of is how that comes to be uh, monitored and there will be a monitoring mechanism and there'll be a way of uh, reporting back to UNESCO about how um, the open science is progressing. And I, I just think it's really exciting. I, it was really thrilling to be part of this whole process and to see the way that everybody came together to develop the, um, uh, to develop the uh, recommendation, I think was kind of, was quite thrilling, really. There's a great set of resources on the UNESCO site and I'd really encourage you to have looked at it and it's one of the things that we'll be thinking about at Open Access Australasia. Um, so other things that happened, I think it's fair to say that funders were getting more assertive about open access. 
Um, the Plan S policy is now active. So with effect from 2021, all scholarly publications are on, from research funded by um, uh, Plan S Coalition S funders um, has to be made open access either in a journal, an open access platform or through a repository. And that's without an embargo and with a Creative Commons in, uh, license associated. Um, and they did extensive work last year, including looking at how, for example, um, small journals, the Diamond Open Access, the free to read and free to publish um, journals can be supported. And they did a sort of very rigorous um, defense, I would say, of their, uh, of their rights retention strategy, which is intended to enable authors to make their work open, um, uh, no matter where they, where they submit it. So that was a really interesting set of policy um, developments. And they've, they, again, they've got some great resources that are associated with this, this policy. Um, the other, uh, another big policy that came out, and I mean, there were many policies, but I'm just pulling out a few. Um, the UK uh, RI, um, uh, after, again, after an extensive consultation, um, has indicated that their open access policy will be in place um, after April 2022. Uh, that's for peer-reviewed research articles. Um, in, for monographs, book chapters and edited collections, it'll be from January 20. January 2024, so there's more time for those to, um, uh, to become open. And one of the things that, um, again, this looks very much like the, the Plan S model, so there's no embargo has to be associated with, associated with a um, CC BY license or um, it, with the exception of another license, um, and it can be in a journal or it can be in a repository. So um, a, a really big step forward there, I think. One of the things we've also seen, of course, with the UK is that they are putting money behind that. So there is there's money to support this policy going forward. And then the other one I just wanted to highlight is the fact that European Commission, which, of course, has been very supportive of open access more generally, um, followed in the footsteps of other public, uh, some funders such as the Wellcome, um, the Gates Foundation, and they've launched their own journal called Open Research Europe, which is based on the F1000 platform which allows um, their own, their funded researchers to publish in. So it's, it's very interesting, I think, to see that the fact that um, funders are really sort of putting their money behind um, the, the initiatives that they want to see happening. Um, in relation to that, I think it's just worth uh, mentioning one other thing that I think came to be a bit of an issue or something we, we noted uh, during the year. And that is the fact that um, Publishers are clearly doing uh, some great work in regard to open access, and there's a wide diversity of publishers within the open access space. But one of the things that we are seeing, particularly from the two biggest publishers, so Wiley and Springer Nature, for example, is, is the they really want to champion only fully open access, only journal-based open access. Um, and the kind of words that we're seeing here are um, talking about things uh, such as subscription, uh, uh, subscription tied green OA, which is a sort of, I, I think, a sort of slightly odd set of uh, words to, to use when we're thinking about uh, what open access um, uh, might be. And the idea of they are clearly, I think, trying to um, uh, encourage funders to not support uh, anything that is other than uh, publishing via, um, via journals. I think this is a problem. And I think that we want to be clear that um, for example, we want to support a diversity of open access models. I think it would be a real problem if we see a sort of increase in consolidation and we don't see, um, we see some of these um, other options being shut down. So I think it's just worth noting that's some of the language that's being used. Um, so on the subject of consolidation, though, again, there was a fair bit that happened last year, but again, I've just pulled that too that I think are worth talking about that happened at the um, uh, beginning and end of each of the year. So the first was that, um, uh, Wiley uh, bought, uh, a, a, obviously a, a big general publisher, bought, bought Hindao, which is a, a smaller open access publisher uh, back in January 2021. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that Wiley said that in particular that they hope that that would allow them to expand into new markets. And one of the places they talked about, uh, it was particularly expanding into China. Um, and then at the end of the year, um, we saw uh, finally that the clarif ClariQuest and ProQuest merger was allowed to go ahead for the enormous sum of $5.3 billion. Um, and we know that one of the things that uh, will happen again happens is that is a sort of consolidation in a particular part of the scholarly communication market. Um, the Clarivest, Clarivate and ProQuest merger is quite interesting and there were submissions made uh, to try and uh, prevent this happening. So Spark amongst others filed a 
antitrust brief with the Federal Trade Commission, um, but in the end, they were not successful in, in stopping that going ahead. So I think it will be interesting to see how that plays out over the next um, the next year or so. And I'm sure it won't be the end of um, any of the submission, any of the consolidations that um, are going to happen in the market. Um, and I guess the uh, the thing that pushes back against that is a focus on open infrastructure. So two things again to highlight from this. First is um, the Invest in Open, which is a, um, a global initiative which is, has attracted some uh, funding and also support from a number of institutions to, to really come up with a, a catalog of open infrastructure services to scrutinize them carefully. Um, and then ultimately, or at least uh, sort of in, in the first iteration, attempt to provide advice to those who want to um, use these services and those who want to support them. Um, and at the end of last year, they um, they launched their first uh, sort of big piece of work, which is called the Catalogue of Open Infrastructure Services. Um, and what that does is it's a really interesting list of um, uh, the kind of uh, of how these services are funded, how they're managed, who runs them, um, what their funding looks like, whether it's stable, um, and any other sort of information that they were able to glean from both public sources, but also from um, interviews with the um, with the infrastructure services themselves, so that we can understand ex how, how they're run. The, the first 10 are really interesting. So they range from things like um, Cielo, which is the enormous um, initiative in, in, in Latin America, uh, through to uh, DOI, which is one of the particularly interesting ones. The DOI obviously is cr absolutely critical infrastructure for open for open access and you know for um for really across the whole of um scholarly communication and it, and it's it's very interesting to look to see how little is actually known about how for example how the doi system um is is, is managed so uh, this is just the first tranche of work and there'll be a whole bunch of other ones coming out fairly shortly um and then the other uh, area of uh, that's done great work in open infrastructure is the uh, is SCOS. Um, uh, they last year they published their um, their three year plan, which was to pr promote sustainability of open science infrastructure, uh, raise awareness about the importance of it, and to build and maintain trust in in the infrastructure. Um, they have now managed to uh, uh, acquire, uh, sort of uh, attract more than three point five million euros in pledging for the open infrastructure. For, for more than 100, 290 institutions globally, and there's eight infrastructures that are now supported as part of that. So it's a substantial amount of work that's gone into uh, managing the uh, supporting infrastructure. Um, so really interesting to see where those will go this year as well. So what about regionally? Just some things to highlight um, here. Uh, first off, in, in Australia, um, Cathy Foley came in at the beginning of last year and uh, she announced that open access was one of her key priorities. Um, throughout the year that she took, uh, took advice and had a lot of conversations with many groups, individuals, um, both here and overseas. And she's now in the process of developing a document for consultation that uh, we understand will come out in, in March, I believe. Um, the NHMRC put out a consultation on their open access policy, um, which was looked look very much like um, the type of ones that we're seeing from Europe. So with immediate open access and uh, Creative Commons licenses, um, and they're now considering that feedback and it won't be incorporated into the current range of grants that are, uh, are happening right now. Another big thing that happened um, in Australia is we have a research infrastructure roadmap that is published every, every three years, I believe. Um, and it, uh, the consultation for that came out at the end of last year. Thus far, there's been no support for scholarly uh, communication within it. There's a lot of support for, for data, for example, the ARDC is, is uh, the Australian Research Data Commons is funded through this um, initiative, and um, uh, we've uh, but there's thus far no support for, uh, for example, for publishing in any way. And our submission, we made the, the case that we thought there was a need for investment in repositories and a diverse ecosystem of open scholarship. So it'll be interesting to see again where that goes this year. And um, we've also been looking at um, what's happening in New Zealand, and I'll we'll talk a little bit about a bit later on about some other things there. Um, some practical things that happened last year, um, uh, we, we were just pleased to say, see that Open Access um, Week in 2021 was an enormous week for us. We had a fantastic group of um, uh, group across Australia from uh, New Zealand who helped pull this all together. 
We had more than 1,700 people register, more than 1,000 bodies actually turned up for the events across the five days of Open Access Week, which ranged from a discussion with, um, uh, which included Cathy Foley on the first day through to an escape room um, uh, later on in the week and huge engagement. And uh, we were really pleased to see the amount of interest that there is in, in that area. Um, I'll just highlight the, the, the work that, um, that Call has done throughout last year um, with their read and publish agreements. Um, and we know that uh, uh, there's now 12 of those in place and there are others under discussion. So those have been uh, taken up by a, a large number of the universities across Australia and New Zealand. And um, uh, will, will, there'll be great interest in seeing how, that, how those um, develop. And then the other um, initiative just to highlight is, is uh, the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative, COKI. Uh, which has, is doing some really interesting work on the openness of universities and institutions more generally, and has assembled a massive data set of, that is able to track and monitor um, uh, both uh, publications, but also other things related to institutions. Um, and I think will be very important if we want to think about alternative ways of uh, tracking research and um, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of openness, uh, which go beyond the current metrics that we currently use. Um, so what about us? One of the things that, so we had a, a fairly big year, particularly at the beginning of last year, we, um, we changed our, our name, our website, our branding, and um, most importantly, we increased the number of resources that we we're able to have within our, uh, within our website. So one of the things we're particularly pleased about um, is the directories that we have up here, um, which in, illustrate, for example, um, uh, open repositories, open journals, um, open book publishing, open policies, and we're very keen to hear from any, anybody who wants to know about um, uh, what we should have on there, or if you feel like we've missed out what should be on your institution itself. Um, some of the things that we did throughout the year, as well as the advocacy, which is just listed here, and all of this is included on our website, so you can go back and have a look at the kind of things that we got involved with. Uh, we also uh, 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 coordinated, as I say, community practice. We ran uh, webinars throughout the year on a range of topics from, uh, from the importance of openness in um, images through to uh, repositories um, and to openness in, in, the law, in the law literature. So what we're trying to do with our, our webinars in particular is to sort of highlight the diversity of open approaches across the region. Um, and we continue to be active on, on media and social media in various different ways. And, We've certainly found that one of the ways that people want to uh, interact with us is via Twitter, because it's kind of quick and you can get a great update on uh, what's happening fairly easily. Um, we also had some new ideas. So one of the things that I was really pleased with is Sally uh, came up with the idea of uh, um, a, a sort of really innovative way of thinking about um, how we might engage people in um, some co core set concepts of Open Access Week. Um, and that was the, uh, the most the most entertaining one was the um, virtual escape room that ran during OA week for the first time, and we've run it a couple of times since then. Um, uh, for all the nerds in the room, it's it's great fun, and it sort of came up some what what we found was it highlighted some really interesting resources, but also kind of talked about some things that we really wanted to get across when we're talking about openness. For example, the need to think about you know fair principles, the need to, the need to think about um, uh, DOIs, the need to think about licenses and such like. So. Um, that will be available. If you're interested, uh, please get in touch and we're happy to, to run that another time or you can even run it yourself. And then uh, later on uh, this year, we'll be uh, launching our Open Access Course 101. And the aim for that is, uh, it, at this point, it will be for, for our, uh, anyone individuals from our member institutions. It'll be a blend of self-paced learning with interactive discussions. And the idea is for the increasing number of people that we know are coming into the open access space that are having to advise um, academics or sort of get up to speed quickly, that this will provide an easy way for them to get across the principles quite quickly. So that's um, the end of what I'm just gonna talk about. Um, I'm now gonna, uh, Martin and I are gonna um, discuss what's on the horizon for 2021, uh, both externally and internally. And whilst we do that, please feel free to type your questions into the chat and then we'll, we'll come back to them. Thank you, Ginny. Um, so I think um, this year we've really got a wonderful opportunity to think here in Australia, also over the other side there in New Zealand, um, about what a national approach to open access can be for us. Um, you know, we could have 
Um, we could maybe have a common approach or two slightly different approaches would be fine. But, you know, also just reflecting what's happening um, around the world with Plan S and maybe, you know, what our local flavour might look like, because it needs to work for, I think, um, what's worked here before um, also has to reflect investment that we've had, um, I think, with our repositories as well. Um, I think also just a desire uh, to have the, you know, I'd like to have the range of systems um, in open access and infrastructure as well, I think seems to really be what I think a lot of people are wanting um, in the sector as, to, as well. So, you know, how are we going to bring that all together and and have a style of OA and a national approach that works for each of our nations, Australia and in New Zealand? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that um, is really particularly worth highlighting is the importance of the small journals that support local initiatives. And I, um, you know, for example, the, the great work that uh, what AUT does with their their model of publishing their Tufera is which supports local publishing their indigenous journals here. I think that that's something that does seem to have got lost in some of the bigger discussions. And um, do you have a sense, Martin, for how how we might promote those? Um, look, I, I agree. I think it's important. Uh, I think for researchers. Um, in our nations to have outlets where they can publish, you know, research about local issues. Um, you know, whether that be local environment um, or like wildlife or politics, you know, because if it's like if researchers in our own countries don't have outlets, you know, then it, it makes it hard to research on those topics um, and to be noted. So I do think that's really important. It's part of the diversity that we need to maintain. And, you know, it may be a little bit at odds with some of the rankings view of things but you know for example in Australia if our researchers don't you know if our researchers aren't doing research onto Australian issues you know, then who is right so I, I just think that's really important yeah yeah and I mean and then just looking back at looking at the other things that are happening the work that Consul is doing um I've just put up a, a shot from their, their priorities for 2022 to 25 about supporting that lo work locally there. I, th I think one of the things that, you know, we haven't focused on Open Access Australasia is um, the open textbook movement in particular. There are others that are working on that. And I wonder if that's something that, again, you know, it helps us make the case for open access for sure when you're wanting people to think about, um, you know, the import, how, whether you can reuse it in your textbooks themselves. So I think it's, an, it's, an, it's interesting to think about it, about open scholarship more generally as a, as a um, model that we should perhaps be um, able to focus on. Um, do you want to talk about, Martin, about the UNESCO? I think it might be worth touching a little bit on that. And what do you think the role of a group like ours might be able to do in, in supporting the UNESCO recommendation? It's so obviously government wide to some extent. So the part that we'll do is, you know, will be a sort of relatively limited, but I think that um, it's an interesting to think that that's something that we'll have to promote across this region. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I think our, a role for our group um, is to keep on talking about it and to make sure, you know, that there is focus and that uh, there's media time and that um, we have opportunities for people to discuss how that can work in our countries as well and perhaps um you know how that is going to interplay with approach as well and you know i think a lot of these changes you know they can't happen you know really quickly so you really have to keep on talking about them for quite a long time to really um yeah i want to happen and to make a difference yeah yeah one of the one of the uh, ways I heard people talking about UNESCO at the end of last year was about it was a, a sort of advocacy toolkit. Um, it, it wasn't itself on it going to do anything. That, but you're right that it's a way that we can continue talking about it and raising the awareness of of, of people about it. Um, I thought it one of again with one of the things that we've tried to do last year in particular was to do more collaboration with different groups. And one of the groups that um, we had a little bit to do with was the Citizen Science Association in Australia who are doing great stuff with regard to open access and obviously that's really kind of important for their work 
So that's good. Um, and then just before we get on to questions, uh, do you want to, any thoughts about what's happening at, with, within our group next year or this, this year? <laughs> and, uh, and in particular types of resources that you know, we're hoping to, to launch. Yeah, great. So, um, so this is uh, the end of at least a two year term or possibly four year term um, for all the members of the executive. Um, so later in the month, we're having uh, the AGM and the strategy meeting. Um, so there will process. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's an opportunity, I think, to hand the baton. Um, also uh, to have new people involved with new ideas and new leadership. So, you know, I feel, you know, really happy uh, with all the great work that we've done with the executive, Ginny. Um, you know, and I think we had a, I think a really good opportunity uh, to make a difference. So um, it's going to be an exciting time um, as well, uh, I think, uh, for Open Access Australasia and for Open Access in our countries um, as well. And I just also want to really just also I'd say a few words about the resources, the new resources that we've had produced by Sally. Um, yeah, I really think that they have been really, really outstanding, well received. Um, I really just want to commend, I think, the thinking that's gone into them um, and also into the quality of the resources that have been produced. Um, and, you know, there's lots of scope to do more um, in that space as well, which is going to be really interesting uh, to see what is made available and also how it's used and how it's made a difference, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the things that we've really learned is that uh, you can't, you can't, you can't um, over, sim not simplify, it's really important to present things easily and simply because people that are coming into this space, you know, often coming in very quickly and they just need, need to grab resources. And so, yeah, I think we, I've, we've increasingly learned the importance of really high quality resources to display um, information. So it's been great having those. Okay, so should we um, go on to some questions now? There's one uh, from uh, uh, fr from Danny, so I'll I'll kick off Danny Kingsley. I'll just uh, read it out, and then Martin, if you want to um, have a, a, we can discuss it. So, uh, the question of bibliodiversity, I think um, this relates to the the work that Call has been doing about at the moment, which is promote uh, primarily supporting a lot of work on uh, the read and publish agreements. Um, what do we think about what what do you think about the importance of bibliodiversity uh, more generally and, and perhaps how does that um, interact with the work that Cool's doing so yeah you know we're all sort of i guess we're working out from smaller organizations with limited resources um here in open access australasia with the current executive we've always sort of wanted to work with the diversity of strategies, thinking that they can all add value. And if we run with all of them, we think that's going to maximize, I think, the transition to open access. So that's been our view in Open Access Australasia. Um, but if I just make also mention of Call, um, so, you know, they've chosen also with their limited resources to put I think a lot of energy into one strategy at one time. And that is where a lot of money is in that strategy. And that's also where they have roles employed. So I think, you know, they have to do work on that strategy because they're doing the deals um, and they are helping with managing the money in that space. So I think what they're doing is their job. And it's not open access Australasia's job because we're not managing other negotiations um, and other subscriptions and the money. So, and also I think last year Call made a lot of progress. So, you know, I just want to thank, you know, I would just like her to thank them um, with the progress that they've made uh, through the committee um, to get the number of offers that they have. I mean, you know, there's always scope for doing more, but we have more time to do that. So in a way, what we're thinking and what Call is doing, you know, can help work together without a lot of overlap, perhaps is a good way of looking at it, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, th I, it remind, I mean, this, I guess, if you look globally, what this, the, the strategy of, of OA 2020, which was led by the Max Planck in Berlin, that was very much their approach was the, the, the kind of approach that Call has taken. And that's been hugely successful for a number of institutions globally. But I think that one of the um, 
uh, one of the other things that we've seen is the need to support experimentation. And, you know, I mentioned the UKRI policy, and one of the things that they've put within that is a particular, a specific pot of money for experimentation within open access. And that's clearly, you know, the other end of the spectrum from, from what Call's doing. Um, and I'll just note that uh, Kim, Kim Terry from, from New Zealand has also noted, you know, the idea of keeping the system diverse and the importance of one size not, not fitting all, I think is, is a kind of, is, is, is it, that's a good role for us to be playing, I think. Um, okay, question from M. Johnson. So um, uh, the question is, do we, do, do we as an advocacy body see a role in assisting institutions in developing and implementing or reviewing and strengthening OA policies at the institutional level? Um, so I think that's part of the diversity as well, and it's really important. Um, I think as we, you know, I think as we talk more about a national approach to OA, I still think, um, especially in the meantime, um, to have institutional responses to open access is really important. And it also, um, you know, it also um, helps to give resources uh, to authors and researchers about uh, and how they can implement in their institution. Um, you know, it helps guide the work of the library as well. Um, it also, you know, helps uh, give so the research division also to give that our work to do, um, and so that we're all aligned um, in particular as well. So yeah, I think I think it's still really important. Yeah, and and just we do help, we do do that. So very happy to support institutions in it. I think one again, it's really interesting to see the diversity of approaches. So obviously, Martin at UNSW, um, you have a very strong open access policy, which is uh, you know which is fantastic, but and and has a very particular you know language around it. Um, I'll just also highlight you know Griffith University, who've got um, an open science policy. Um, which is a sort of a different approach to take. And I think it's really important to some extent to understand the landscape at your institution um, as to what, you know, what, what an institution is willing to support. And it's definitely not the same for all institutions. Our policy, a position statement, Danny says, about Griffith. But the fact is that Griffith have, you know, this is substantial support for, um, for open science at Griffith University. And I think that's been, that's been important. Um, okay, any other questions that anyone wants to raise? Or Martin, was there anything you wanted to, to follow up on? Let's see if there's any other questions. We've got a bit of time. Please ask them. I wonder if it's worth talking about the role of, um, of, of government in this space. Well, not, not but government departments. One of the things that we have tried to do is to, yes. is to have, a, have a conversation across the sort of wider landscape, but it's interesting that we, at uh, this point, the, the work in Australia is being led by the Australian chief scientist. Um, and the importance, I think, of somebody like that being able to convene government bodies has been, has been really critical in moving the open access agenda on. Um, so comment rather than a question. So Lookman Hayes, uh, again, from New Zealand. Um, this is while I appreciate there are different avenues to OA, not all the equitable routes or indeed equitable routes for openness and for open scholarship. Yeah, I think that's a great comment, actually. Um, what, Martin, is there anything you'd like to add with regard to that, particularly with, you know, from smaller institutions, where I think one of the roles that we've been trying to do is to support the role of smaller institutions? Um, no, I, I think Open Access Australasia is, you know, we're really happy to work with all institutions on what works for you, you know, and what sort of support that you need at your institution. Um, you know, so the support we give to institutions may differ, and I, I think that's fine. Um, I do think, though, that possibly now is a good time to have a bit more focus on repositories than we might have had, um, I think, in recent years. Um, I just think you know, um, most university libraries have hundreds of subscriptions with different publishers and not just a dozen or two. So, you know, we still need that route um, for all the other publishers in the meantime. And we also um, need that route because it can help put a little bit of pressure on the publishers around pricing. Yeah, uh, you know, I just, I just think it's an important time for us to focus on that a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and I think that as we're saying, there's a few people talking about the idea of the, uh, you know, the, having having a multitude of diverse approaches does allow us to push back on, you know, just the, the journal first model of open access. And we know that repositories are, you know, by them, you know, by their very um, kind of nature, are support equity of, of access and, you know, the ability to publish um, wherever you want. So I think that it is a, having those multiple models is increasingly important. Uh, you know, as we've said, equity is right at the top of our list of principles, and it's something that we're trying to think about when we, whenever we sort of work with any um, uh, institutions or, or uh, publishers. Um, uh, yeah, so a question about um, uh, uh, open science initiatives. So uh, this is from Ingrid Unger. Um, Kathy Foley is an advocate for the science area. Is there also a strong push for OA um, in the humanities and uh, arts and humanities field? Do you want to start with that and yeah. then we can talk about the UNESCO side of that? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's partly a language question. Um, different parts of the world use open research. Others use our scholarship, others are talking about only science, but I think I think when many parts of the world talk about open science, um, I think they often mean all of the academic disciplines and not just the STEM. So um, I think it's partly a language issue. Here in Australia, we tend to think of, you know, we tend to think differently about science. Um, so maybe in Australia, um, we use our scholarship perhaps and science. I think interchangeably. Yeah, and it, it was very interesting um, that when the UNESCO Open Science recommendation was actually being discussed, this question came up exactly about, you know, does science just mean the hard sciences? And if you look in the language of it, there's a very specific text around humanities and social sciences, that, so that's specifically included. Um, and But th at the same time, what we have seen is that some of these, uh, you know, policies recognise the need recognize the fact that it's harder to get, for example, books and monographs immediately open in the same way you can for journal publications. So that's why, for example, the UKRI policy uh, is 2022 for journal publications, but 2024 for the things that are more related to um, humanities and social sciences. So I think we have the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to think about it there. I would absolutely you know, encourage anybody who cares about this to you know, get involved with their academy, for example, because there's a lot of thinking happening within the academies in this area at the moment as well. And I think it's really important to make sure it's, you know, it's fully informed by what academics need in this space. Um, okay, a couple of other questions. So the first one is about um, embargo free options for repositories uh, where there's this idea of um, uh, journals say 12 months. Um, uh, and, I, and Amanda is a, is a researcher. I wonder if it's, do you want to talk a bit about the read and publish and how those work, Martin? Is that is that perhaps worthwhile here? Because for some of these, for some of these journals, the, the embargo period may well have gone away with the read and publish options that we have. True, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Um, so we've gone from a situation, I suppose, where, um, we were encouraging, you know, or perhaps allowing authors to pay an article processing charge into a pure gold journal and maybe not so much supporting into hybrid. But because of the change to open access and the desire for read and publish deals at a time, really when budget has been tight for most university libraries, um, what Call has done is work with, um, is to work with some of the public to advocate for read and publish deals that move really are the subscription journals, which, which were either subscription only or they were hybrid across into the read and publish space, but they haven't included all of the pure gold journals in agreements. And that's really because at the time, um, because I know uh, that in call, uh, which I'm a member, uh, the council, there was agreement that we would focus on agreements which were in which we could contain cost, right? So we didn't have more money to bring more of the journals into the agreements. So that's why we've really moved across the subscription and hybrid journals that were already in which 
liquidity and other subscription packages across into open. So they will provide after immediate uh, publication um, open access to those agreements um, without the authors having to pay an article processing charge. Uh, there are some of them that have got uh, caps um, in that uh, with the number of articles that can be published under the agreement. Um, you know, and we'll be managing that um, through call. Um, and that will still be some journals um, which are pure gold, which are outside um, of those agreements as well. So really, I mean, authors then will need to develop some understanding about how that works and then which journals are in the agreements and which are out. So they can pay an APC to publish in the pure gold or they can openly without an AP journals in those agreements. And, you know, I, I think I think authors, you know, I guess it's just one more thing to think about, you know, which, you know, with our where to publish. And I, I do think also authors should be thinking about um, whether the journal, you know, which that they are going to be submitting to um, is going to give them the immediate open access that they want. Yeah. yeah. So uh, without knowing where Amanda come from, it's worth engaging actively with your, your library and make sure that you understand which libraries, your, which of these your, your library has uh, supported. And there is going to be a lot of work this year, I think, isn't there? Kind of, there's a community practice that's already been um, organised by call and a lot of scrutiny of these, um, how these um, deals are going to work over the course of the year. So, but at this point, you know, researchers have more options to publish open access than they previously had. Oh, thanks, Amanda. So from UWA. So UWA absolutely will have resources on this. Um, and you can absolutely, uh, you know, there'll be more options and we'll need to just monitor the uptake of this over the course of the year. That's what's happened with um, these deals globally. Um, I think it's fair to say when you first start off with them, you're not entirely sure how it's going to work. But I think as we go forward, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be more options to see how, um, where you can publish. And just following on the comments in the chat, you know, with in, uh, academics from smaller institutes, this is one of the things that I think we're going to need to work out over the course of the year, how these smaller organisations um, get included in these deals. And that's something for, for Call to consider, I guess, was that Call is wider than just, um, just university libraries. There are more other institutions to involve, as far as I understand. Um, okay. Uh, and just following on in the chat, yes, thanks, Em. Chat to your liaison librarians. <laughs> Make sure you know who knows about these deals and, um, you know, don't try and navigate it by yourself, I think is the, the key thing for researchers at this point. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, we, um, we might be able to give everybody a few minutes of their day back. Martin, anything you want to uh, wrap up with? So um, I would just like to say thanks to everybody for joining our webinar um, today. Uh, I, um, so I hope you, that you found that an interesting discussion um, and the slides will be available. Thank you so much to, also to you, Ginny, uh, for presenting those slides so expertly um, and for all your work throughout last year um, and for the year coming as well. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thanks, Martin. It's been a pleasure. It's always great fun. It's a fascinating landscape to be part of. And, uh, and it's really, um, a, really great to see the engagement um, uh, on the webinar today. We will be continuing our series of webinars throughout the year um, uh, with some more coming up um, probably in about a month's time. So please keep an eye on our website, keep an eye on our Twitter and such like. Um, if you're not a member institution and would like to be, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but uh, please also do think about joining the communities of practice. Thanks very much and we'll see everybody next month.